Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, as you may know, this is the 10th year in our uh, Student Scholar Series, which was initiated to recognize notable legal scholarship produced by members of the student body during the previous academic year and to foster the skills associated with presenting and defending that scholarship in a professional conference style setting. Today's presentation will be made by third year law student Raymond McGorian. And before I introduce him, I'll say a few words about the respondent to this presentation, Professor Jeff Watson. Um, Professor Watson served as an uh, attorney advisor in the office of the legal advisor of the U.S. Department of State in Washington, D.C. And while at the State Department, he specialized in international criminal law and in legal aspects of U.S. policy in the Middle East. He joined the full-time faculty in 1998 and is the author of numerous articles on public international law and has published a book on the Oslo Accords, co-authored a book on American contract law. He's taught everything there is to teach. He was a former power forward with who was that? The Celtics. I see. The Celtics it was. All right. Uh, and now, let me introduce our presenter today. Uh, Raymond McGorian is a third-year law student in the day program. He is an active member in our uh, uh, the Student Bar Association, the communications director there, and with the Comparative and International Law Institute. He uh, went to school here at Catholic. He studied international relations in Arabic, and in his junior year of undergrad, he studied a semester in Amman, Jordan, with an intensive Arabic and Middle East studies uh, program there. During the summer of his first year of law school, he interned with White and Case LLP in Warsaw, Poland, and later that summer, he studied international trade and comparative law at the Agalonian in Krakow. During his second year, Raymond focused on energy and environmental law by clerking for the NEPA, Office of the Environmental Protection Agency. He later clerked for the Chief Counsel of the Bureau of Engraving and Printing at the U.S. Treasury. And in his last year, he's working as an outside counsel for Greenberg Traurig, is that right? Traurig LP in Washington as a translator and Middle East specialist. He's expected to graduate in 2018, this May, soon, and will be awarded a certificate in the Comparative International Law Institute. His interest in the topic was piqued by his interest uh, in international law and in maritime uh, disputes, and hence the topic of his presentation, the driving force behind international maritime disputes. I'll turn the floor over to Raymond. Thank you. All right, thank you, Professor Harmon, and uh, thank you everyone for coming out today um, to show your support. and. Um, me and Professor Watson about this topic. Um, so, yeah, just going forward, um, I just have a, a couple of numbers to rattle off as I set my timer so I don't go over time here. Um, so, obviously, we have you know law of the land, and that's kind of like what we learn in, in law school. But seventy percent of the world is is covered with water. Eighty percent of people live on the coast. That might be affected by global warming and, and climate change. Um, and 90% of trade is through the, the seas. So there was definitely a demand then for um, something that could bring us together in, in figuring out law of the seas. Um, you know, back you know, in the colonial powers time, we had the, these giant powers, uh, these giant maritime powers like England and, and, and America too, which kind of ruled by force, and, but now after World War II, we had to come together and had to make um, a kind of international law that could give countries uh, vested rights, give countries um, expectations in their, their land and their territory off their coast. Um, you know, back in the time of uh, you know, colonial powers, it used to be three nautical miles, about as long as you could shoot a cannon. Um, but, you know, that was kind of the traditional approach to maritime law. But there is kind of a question, you know, how, how long should we have a territorial sea? How long should we have these rights that we have on our on our land and how long should we ex extend them and especially with uh, issues with overfishing and issues later with hydrocarbons um, you know we had to create a constitution of the sea so that is unclose or un uniclose and it kind of rolls off the tongue but uh, so uniclose is a very detailed constitution there's 320 articles uh, nine annexes and two implementing agreements um, so it goes every, you know, it goes from everything from fishing and seabed mining um, to a flexible dispute mechanism in um, in Article Seven, so or in, in Section Seven. 
So Uniclose has been kind of it molded along the way, and it, it's gone through Uniclose 1, Uniclose 2, and then the one that we've implemented today, Uniclose 3, um, from 1973 to 1982 when it was um, kind of uh, codified, so just like Star Wars, like you don't have to worry about the prequels, the third one is the best <laughs> one. Um, but you know, it's a very detailed attempt to have a standardized maritime law um, in today's world, which is very important for countries that are, vest that are kind of contending um, for these areas like the South China Sea and the, and the, the Arctic that I'll go over later. Um, so yeah, so like I said, it, it's kind of revolutionary for the time because it, it, it expected a lot of issues that were going to arise with pollution, with global warming, and with disputes between nations. Um, obviously, we know land is, are, are not, you know, our, our boundaries for our countries are not perfect squares. So we're going to have overlapping exclusive economic zones, even overlapping territorial er areas, or we're going to have bilateral agreements that settle these areas. And also, we're going to have to have a certain um, kind of international law or a certain uh, constitution that we can use, that we can point to, to have these, uh, to resolve these issues. Um, and there's also, like I said, you know, in um, Article 298, there's a small cop-out for countries that, like large countries that want to uh, kind of get out of the convention when it deals with their, um, their sovereignty rights, and China took that. Um, so that's one thing I'll go to later. Um, but there's one issue, America never ratified the agreement, just like a lot of other um, large uh, international agreements, we kind of, uh, we signed it, you know, in the Reagan administration, but there was one issue that really was the kind of the sticking point, and that's the ISA, the International Seaboard Authority. So um, in UNCLOSE, when you go beyond our exclusive economic zone and sometimes our um, continental shelf, there is the area, as they call it, and in this area, it's, it's gonna be a lot of shared rights, and they were, worried about, if you guys have heard like the tragedy of the commons and property class, kind of worried about that. If a lot of countries have an international water um, and no one really has claim to it, then people will just pollute it, people will overfish it, and so they had to make this international seabed authority which regulates countries on these international waters. Um, so that was our sticking point. We frankly thought it was very communist and a lot of people in the Senate still today don't want to ratify it even though Rex Tillerson, who's a Republican, um, you know, big Exxon guy, says we should ratify it. A lot of people think we should ratify it because we want our place at the table, but still to this day, we're in good company there with South Sudan and Syria. Um, so another thing is uh, my paper went really into depth on drilling and these technology uh, changes that have you know, sparked these maritime disputes. And there is a giant, there's a huge correlation. This kind of also got me into this. Uh, topic between um, this new technology of drilling, these things called um, these, um, they're like submersible uh, drill, like regs or rigs. So you basically can float a rig over to a certain area in the sea and then drill from there. Um, so that has been huge and we've gone down to depths that like we've never had before where one of these um, rigs have gone, has gone down to 11,000 feet. So that's kind of just pushing the envelope. We can go far into the water and it's been a lot less expensive. So, you know, the cheapest oil today is from Saudi Arabia, but we can get very comparable oil in our Gulf, which is, you know, right next door instead of importing it from them. So, um, so the semi-submersible platform has just been revolutionary, and that's, you know, and I'll talk later, but China has even floated one over to the, the waters of Vietnam, and it's really, like, angered them. Obviously, you would be, because that's your sovereignty, and, and people want to keep their sovereignty, and you can push them below by, putting these rigs in certain places um, and kind of, you know, showing other countries that you're powerful. Um, so in, in 19, you know, in 1950s when this first started, only 1% of the oil in the world was uh, mined um, off the coast, uh, but now today 25% is. So it's, it's just grown astronomically and, and the demand is going to be there tomorrow. So it's, you know, silly to think that, you know, this oil isn't the sparking point for this, it, but it is. You know, hydrocarbons are everywhere, and if you look at the most disputed places in the world, like the Arctic and the South China Sea, there are huge, you know, reserves of, of hydrocarbons, gas, and oil. So it, that's just what happens. So the fun part, and this is really, you know, the kind of the, the bread and butter of the, uh, the UNCLOS is the zones. So obviously you have internal bays and waters. Um, so that would be, you know, something 
like you know, an outlet or estuary or anything that goes into the water, that is your territory. 100%, uh, you know, that's just based on an extended um, vesting rights of, of your land. Second is the territorial zone, which is 12 nautical miles. And keep in mind, nautical miles aren't the same as normal miles. They're a little bit larger. So 12 nautical miles is about 14 miles. Um, just something to think about. But so, like I said, this constitution is very detailed. So they really go into detail here. And we take the, the baseline, so that's at low tide, the lowest part of your baseline. And then you stretch out 12 nautical miles. And with the territorial sea, you have all the rights of the normal land. You can stop people. You can, you know, if it's if you're against gambling in that of that country, you can, um, you know, that's basically your land. They're basically trespassing your land, except for one caveat, and that's innocent passage. Uh, but basically, innocent passages, you just can't be testing weapons. You have to continuously be moving through the waters, and um, a couple other uh, issues there. But besides that, I mean. That's basically a continuation of the land. Then you have a continuous zone, a contiguous zone, which is another 12 nautical miles. Um, and this is like, as I like to call it, it's like, you know, your territorial diet, kind of like land. It's, it's a little bit lighter. There's a certain, um, so like for immigration and for stopping drug smuggling and other issues like that, um, then you're allowed to enforce those rights. Um, and then there's uh, exclusive economic zones that I'm going to go into depth a little bit about later, and then continental shelf. So hypothetically, if I had, let's say I open up a cruise ship and I use my flag of convenience for the Netherlands and I had, you know, illegal smoking marijuana, prostitution on the cruise ship, as I was going through the international waters, that's legal in maybe in Netherlands. But once I get into this territorial water, they can get us. Like that's, you know, then all of a sudden the Coast Guards can take you, you know, you're in trouble. You gotta dump all the weed because that's, uh, that's you know, a big problem. Um, so easy and continental shelves. I, I love the Philippines because it's a really good example of internal waters, and then you've got contiguous zones, and then you've got the EEZs. You know, the Philippines is just, it's a good case study by itself. Uh, so fi Article 56 gives the EEZ zones and vesting rights of the country. Uh, basically says, it gives, just basically gives the country a water column. So anything in the seabed and then up to the top of the, of the sea, that means fishing, all resources, natural, uh, living and non-living resources, a country can exploit those. That's yours. Um, and then continental shelf is a little bit different because you have, in your continental shelf, you have the sea basin of that up to uh, 350 miles. So that you have, if you have the EZs, that's 200. And then the continental shelf, that'll give you at the most 350. So that's EZ plus 150 nautical miles of, of water. And I mean, that's really tough. So Continental shelves are everywhere, obviously. You know, if you look at the Arctic, like I'll show you later, it, there's a lot of overlapping continental shelves. So the convention was so smart, they have this, um, this kind of tribunal that gives you, after you ratify, you have 10 years to submit your scientific evidence for this, to claim your continental shelf. A lot of countries have done it, um, and basically they look at the scientific evidence and they say if it's, it's valid or not, and they'll basically give you the green light to start drilling or something in your continental shelf. Um, but also these are, the, for the EEZs rather, these are exclusive rights. So if someone comes into the Philippines water and starts drilling and they're EEZ, they can, you know, try to kick them out or, you know, China's done this a couple of times in the, in the, um, off the coast of, of Vietnam, so they're just kind of an aggravating course in the South China Sea. Um, and then Article 4, 84 gives, uh, countries, uh, the right for tunneling, which has never been explained, but I like to think if you go into what, you know, horizontal fracking and other stuff like that, a country could technically tunnel into someone else's easy, um, but, you know, that's still up for debate. So there are some passages that are kind of still um, up for debate here um, in certain areas. Um, so drilling outside the easy is really interesting. Um, hasn't been done much because obviously at that depth, no rigs are really capable of doing that, um, but it's still a possibility. But one of the reasons why America didn't ratify this too is because of this International Seabed Authority. So under, under the International Seabed Authority, you have to share some profits of that. You also have to share your technology to other developing countries. So this is like very developing countries friendly in this area because like I said before, this is like tragedy to the commons. We're worried about overfishing. We're about, worried about pollution in countries that start 
fracking or drilling outside of their um, EZs and outside of their shelves could really get into some trouble. Um, so that's you know one of the reasons why we're really sensitive about stuff like that. Um, so another fun thing about the area is that you a lot of countries flag the fly of convenience, convenience, um, and most of them are under Panama because uh, countries are really worried about taxation and um, like uh, working worker rights issues too, worker law, um, labor law. So if you see most ships that are, that are going through international water fly the flag of Panama because it's cheaper and um, everything like that until you get into the territorial waters and then you know then you have to abide by the rules of that country. Um, so um, another thing that the Constitution or the sea in close kind of goes uh, you know goes really into detail is about a lot of the laws of the sea when it comes to shipping. Shipping's a, a big part like I said 90 percent of our trade is in shipping. Um, you know it goes all the way from what side of the of the ocean do you pass on? A lot of other customary law issues that, you know, have just been um, kind of codified through uh, in close. So in practice, um, this is just a map of the South China Sea, and obviously, like I said before, countries don't have straight boundaries. So you have just kind of a, a cluster of of claims here. This uh, red claim is called the Nine Dash Claim, and that's what China said is their territory. Um, and as you can see, it's just, it's crazy how much territory they said they have. And this, they gave us, they said that they have historical rights of fishing and, and China has been down here before. Many of these islands they claim um, are theirs. Um, so basically the Philippines took them to court. Philippines uh, filed you know, a charge in the International uh, Permanent Arbitration Court and said that you know, this is not true. We are exclusive economic zone it goes you know, throughout here. Obviously you can see it's Bordering that, and China is invading our sovereignty. Um, so uh, the arbitration court in 2016 ruled for the Philippines. They said that there is no historical um, right here. That th these these are just like you know conjecture, I guess. And, and the Philippines owns this water. So this is like a really big ruling because obviously you know China is a P5 country. This is like USA versus Nicaragua. This is huge. Like we're the P1. China is a P5. Um, as Watson says, but uh, so this is, this is huge because China has been kind of, you know, um, exerting a lot of their force and all of a sudden a country like the Philippines, um, which doesn't have the, the military might of China, can, can take them to court and can get a favorable ruling. Um, so, you know, this is, uh, this is big for the court and um, it was, you know, also big in, in implementing uh, part 15 of the UNCLOS, which, you know, gives, um, a country like the Philippines power to um, to have a review of a certain dispute in, in these areas. Um, but of course China said that they didn't have jurisdiction over them. China said they did the opt out, um, opt out uh, article and under 298. So if anything has to do with um, with their sovereignty, they said that they would opt out of it, that no uh, tribunal has jurisdic jurisdiction over that, which is a very nuanced thing. Um, but basically, China didn't even send people to argue it in front of the court, and they said, you know, we're not even gonna do that because this has nothing to do with us, um, which is tough. I mean, that's why it's also like the US versus Nicaragua case, because we said the exact same thing. Um, but, you know, as of right now, the court did rule for the Philippines, so that is maybe a formality, but I think it's, it's a big, big development. Um, so, we've all heard of the Chinese island building campaign. Um, that was also as part of the dispute, too. But the Constitution, of the sea and close goes into detail about what kind of rights uh, these reefs and these rocks and these islands give. Um, so something under something that just goes above land under low tide doesn't give any maritime um, um, rights. So you know something like a reef that is only present when it's low tide that does not have its own separate maritime zone. Something like a rock might have a territorial sea, but because it, it cannot permanently um, sustain human like um, living, then it doesn't have an EEZ zone. So you really have to have an island um, and that in the South China, South China Sea can have uh, exclusive economic zones. Um, so there's that, but then when you file um, for, to go into the permanent arbitration court or the ICJ, whatever court you choose, um, then it's at that moment you file. So there are a lot of, there is a huge island building campaign obviously from China, but when the Philippines filed a lot of those 
Um, you know, they, a lot of those areas were just still rocks, so they didn't have exclusive economic zones. Um, but it's, you know, like I said, like the UNCLOS is very detailed, and in America we have common law where the judge can in interpret law um, the way he wants, but a lot of these countries that are dealing with this are um, civil law countries, so these, you know, um, these passages in these annexes and these um, articles in, in UNCLOS are very detailed for a reason, so these arbitration courts uh, can just apply them. Um, so the big thing in the future right now is this Arctic dispute, and you know whether you believe that climate change is man-made or not, the facts are that there's about 50% of um, ice still in the Arctic than there was, or there's 50% less ice in the Arctic than there was in 1950. So that's a big deal because there's a lot of passages opening up now. One of them is the Northwest Passage, which kind of goes like this through China, or through Canada, and that itself, you know, by warming up, the shipping containers can go from Europe to Asia in half, as, half the time that they have to go through uh, Panama come out. So ironically, maybe global warming is going to give you know, silver lining, maybe less you know, shipping uh, and burning uh, oil and stuff by, by going through Canada, unfortunately. Um, but that's territory water. So Canada says that they could tax and then that's 100% you know, their water, but US claims that there's an international um, route, just like the Bosphorus Sea and, and Turkey's international route. So they said that you know ships can just go through there no matter how they want. But so that's a, that's a big dispute that's going to go on. And usually the world says it's just international waters. Canada says it's theirs. But also this huge ri ridge here, Russia has already uh, claimed that for themselves. Greenland or uh, Denmark says they have a claim in that. So does Canada and Norway. So those are the big countries. U.S. obviously hasn't ratified it, so we don't have a the seat at the table for this. But we do take this. Um, and close as customary law, and the Truman Doctrine says that we do have our continental shelves as ours. So it is a little bit different, um, and you know we'll see you know how it, it, it all lines up. But um, it's definitely going to be a, a fight in the future. Um, so basically, this whole this trend isn't going to end soon. Unfortunately, there, there there's going to be a, another rise for oil. Um, they, OPEC says in 2016 it's going to rise to 102. 0.3 billion dollars uh, or billion um, barrels per day, or sorry, million barrels per day, um, and I think you know as more, there's more demand, obviously there's going to be a bigger push for offshore drilling. Um, so you know this demand isn't going to go away, and there's still going to be disputes in the future, and we have to figure out how to how to handle this. Um, you know we can say that uh, we're just going to take a seat at the table, you know, not take a seat at the table, and just have our our rights. Um, without that, but I think it's going to be a serious issue, especially when other countries have already made claims for continental shelves that we can make claims for, potentially with Alaska in the, in the Arctic. Um, so I mean, there are bilateral, bilateral treaties we can go into. A lot of people have proposed a treaty for the Arctic. I think it's a great idea, but I think UNCLOS is also another great idea for solving disputes around the world, especially in the Arctic. Um, so it's up, you know. Up to us, I guess, and and Rex Tillerson, our our, our guy, uh, and the, <laughs> at the uh, State Department, has even said, and he's a big Exxon guy. I mean, the oil companies want this; they want certainty. Certainty means money for them. Um, you know, they they want legal certainty in these areas, and they don't want to have to worry about countries exerting, um, you know, territorial rights and taxes on them too. So it's it's a big issue, and I think, um, you know, as global warming kind of takes over, it's, it's going to be even bigger in these, in these areas where, that have been frozen before. So, yep, that's about it. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks very much, Raymond. That was terrific. Thanks. Um, I want to apologize. Raymond had asked me to wear my blue Hawaiian shirt for the occasion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my coral sea and waves and uh, I forgot. I'm sorry. I feel terrible. Um, so I want to okay. apologize about that. Um, your, your, your paper, which I enjoyed reading, and your talk and your slides uh, put me in mind of a conversation I had 25 years ago uh, in 1992 when the, uh, Bill Clinton had just been elected president. And I had a certain family member who was a about to become his uh, ambassador to the United Nations and later his Secretary of State. And so I was flooded with lobbyists um, from the inter among international law geeks saying, get her to do this, get her to do that. And I thought, 
and had a series of lobbyists. Uh, Lou Henkin, uh, most notably from Columbia Law School, was a big, big dude on the biggest student in that day in international law. And so he made an appointment, come to see me, and I was thinking, will it be about you know, ratifying the Inter-American Convention of Human Rights? Will it be about the protocols to Geneva Conventions? Will it be about um, uh, the um, International Criminal Court? Uh, will it be one of those big things? No. What did he want me to, what was the number one priority to him was the law of the Sea Convention. Um, yeah. So even 25 years ago, um, there was a hard push on the Clinton administration to do so. Uh, and the Clinton administration in 1995, I want to ask you about this in a minute, uh, signed, uh, signed an agreement to mm -hmm. mitigate some of the concerns you mentioned about the, the authority. Uh, and since then, President Bush and President Obama both advocated ratifying. Um, this is getting toward my question, which is whether we should ratify. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, you, you mentioned Secretary of State Tillerson. It's true, before he became secretary, right, yeah, it's not, he not was not all not. for the young class. But yeah. in his confirmation hearing, he was more ambivalent. Yeah. Uh, he kind of deflected questions about it. Um, yeah, that's tough. And so that leads me to my, my first question. I have three, but my first question is, should the United States ratify the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea? There's some of the arguments in favor you mentioned, we already regard it as customary law. Uh, innocent passages in our interests. That's mm -hmm. when warships can pass through the territorial sea, the, the closest, uh, the closest ring of, of ocean around a, a nation. Um, uh, we we are a member of the we're the P one, the one of the five permanent members of the Security Council. So presumably we can yeah. control threats to our sovereignty. Um, but on the other hand, there are a couple of maybe arguments against it. One is the, the somewhat sort of, some people say socialist regime of sharing tech yeah. relating to the seabed floor, <laughs> manganese nodules on the seabed floor, and also yeah. concern about dispute resolution. So, so what's your bottom line? Where do you come down? Uh, should, should the United States ratify? Yeah, I think it's definitely a good idea to ratify. Um, obviously, there are some good arguments from the other side, and, and a lot of senators have made arguments uh, against it. Um, and a lot of those are just sovereignty issues. Um, you know, the fact that we don't control all the seas is an issue, um, but also the fact that we could get dragged into these um, arbitration issues, um, in, like the South China Sea with China, and China was worried about that too. There are, so we can take reservations in this too, and a lot of countries in America is famous for taking reservations and treaties. Um, China tried to do that with that opt-out um, kind of provision and um, I think it was Article 298 where they can basically, if it's something about their sovereignty, then other countries can't bring them to uh, the permanent arbitration court. Um, and then, you know, I'm sure, you know, just like the USA versus Nicaragua too, we don't want to be kind of thrown into something that can, can lead us to um, losing any type of land. But th the way the, you know, UNCLOS works is it, it if anything, it gives us an opportunity to have more, you know, more territory. It gives us an opportunity to claim our continental shelf, which we have, if I go back to that slide before, I mean, we can have up to 300 nautical miles, 350 nautical miles off the coast of Alaska. So that gives us a real claim to that. Any type of disputes we can observe and we can argue about um, if we're a party. And, um, you know, it gives us really a seat at the table. So it's just kind of foolish to, to be kind of arguing from the outside. Um, also that, and like you mentioned before, like this innocent passage is a big thing too with, you know, whether it's in Libya before, um, where we sail our troops right next to, and it really made Gaddafi mad right next to their coast in their internal waters, or that's the South China Sea. I mean, we're buzzing past countries all the time and it'd be great to have a treaty that we can point to. Um, in the treaty for innocent passage, it does say no weapons testing, um, no pollution. I think there's a couple other things. So. It's a little shaky on whether we're allowed to sail our Navy ships. I guess if they're still passing and they don't stop and spy and other things like that, then it's okay. But you know, we're also pretty infamous on kind of you know using these treaties to our advantage and bending them our way because we are the P1. Um, but you know, I, I think these sovereignty claims are just without merit. I think there's just so many great things that can come out of this this treaty, and it, it gives a lot of certainty for companies that want to also um, have you know, economic impact in, in these areas that are kind of pushing the boundaries. And like I said, with these semi submersible rigs, you can go basically anywhere. Um, and we have many islands around the world that could have great exclusive economic zones. Um, and we do take that for customary law, but it would be great to have kind of a, 
a codified um, treaty that we can point to for exerting our power. But it, you know, it's it's something that's been thrown around a lot. I'm sure you know this administration has a lot of other uh, maybe more pressing issues to, to worry about right now. But it's something that will catch up to us in the future. And I think, especially with the Arctic and about this Northwest Passage, it's something that's going to be debated on a lot. And I think it'd be great to have our people there. You know, we were during the implementation of you know close three this long one that went on for many years um america was at the front table i mean we were deciding on doing everything it's like the paris accords you know why would we go out of this you know why if we put so much effort into this why can't we just sign and ratify it but it's we have a you know very political system and and um it, it doesn't look good to say that we ratified something that can drag us into an international arbitration court against a country like the philippines so um you know We'll see, I guess, but it's going to catch up to us if we don't ratify it, I think, someday in, in, these, in these areas, especially with global warming. Like I said, 80% of the people on Earth live in these coastal waters. And what happens if the, the sea levels start to rise? You know, we need some certainty so we can you know, keep everything together. Legal certainty is important, I think, especially in national law. So we'll see, I guess. But, Great. Can yeah. I, I have two more questions. Okay. Uh, my second one actually relates to this slide and to something else you said in your paper. It was about technological um, change. In, in your paper, you mentioned something I didn't really quite know about the Iraq-Kuwait dispute, that the Kuwaitis had drilled oh, yeah. horizontally underneath Iraqi oil fields. I remember those, I remember Saddam complaining about that, but I never understood, I, I dismissed it, thinking, well, what's he talking about? Kuwait's dropping its drills on its side of the border. I didn't realize that the drills might be going sideways. And a related question is about this. Um, uh, you, you said there's a 10, there's a 10 year uh, term, supposedly, in which states can develop their um, their technical claims to the continental shelf. And the United States hasn't been doing that because we're not party to the continental shelf, content, to the UNCLOS and to the Continental Shelf yeah. Commission. Um, is that realistic technologically? That is, can, can states really drill sideways? And realistically, can states in 10 years use sonar or whatever to, to demonstrate how far the continental shelf goes down? I thought even the big kahuna of the United States couldn't, couldn't do that yet, <laughs> couldn't figure out I thought our geologists didn't have the tech yet. So yeah, okay. I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's, it's it's very difficult to to, especially with those depths. I mean, this, in the Arctic, it, the, this ridge is, is the big one that a lot of people claim, and that's um, a lot of people claim as, as a part of their continental shelf. Um, Russia was the first to submit a bid, and they used I think they used like submarines and a lot of um, like you said a lot of sub water. I mean, a, a sub technology to. to figure out you know, where kind of their shelf goes until. Um, but what the court does then, um, we'll just look at it and see if the scientific is, sci science behind it is, is valid. Um, and then from then on, they can you know, grant, I guess, a, a continental shelf. What, what Russia did a while ago, um, I think it was in 2007, they planted a flag at the ridge. So that was a, a big part, you know, just showing their might. Uh, but it's also an area that's disputed with Denmark and, and Canada and, and, and Norway too. So, yeah, I, I, it's obviously really tough to get you know, perfect um, insight you know, on, on who owns what area, especially because it's just you know, there's so many ridges and there's so many areas under these waters that you know could be construed as being a part of Russia or being a part of Denmark. You know, no board, borders perfect, um, but I think it, it would at least be great to have. You know, America there giving our side of it, obviously. Um, and then also, like you said, the horizontal drilling has is been, you know, you can take a drill down you know, almost 11,000 feet um, underwater and you can plant it. Has anyone seen the, um, the uh, Horizon movie? The, um, yeah, Deepwater Horizon, Mark Wahlberg's in it. Good movie. Um, but basically, that's the new technology we have these days, and that was in, in the middle of the. Um, golf and you have this semi-submersible rig and it's just there and, and it's you know ha has a drill but those can go underwater now we're even fracking in the Gulf um, uh, but those can go underwater and they can drill and then they can even go sideways and drill and they can you know open up gas or oil and, and countries have been kind of leading this charge and it's a lot of international companies too with working with countries like Qatar and, and Kuwait Kuwait itself had a lot of technology given to us by the Western powers um, and they use that. I mean, I don't know how valid Iraq's claim is um, about how that they were drilling under um, under their sovereignty. But you know, there are an issue. You know, there was issues with 
you know, who owns certain oil fields in that area, and, and maybe Kuwait was just drilling on their side, but then, you know, took a lot of the oil over to their side. So we'll see. I mean, the, I guess the jury's still out on that. It, you know, maybe it's just a moot issue now because there's no Saddam Hussein, but, uh, it, you know, it, it is, there is technology there that can do the horizontal drilling, and that's why I thought it was interesting in, in UNCLOS talking about um, tunneling, which they didn't really specify what that was, and I really looked into tunneling and what they thought, you know, Article 84, but they never defined it. So I, I you know, and you can do that in your EEZ zone. So maybe tunneling can go into horizontal drilling. And maybe, you know, can you go under someone else's EEZ zone? Is that the future we live in? And I don't even know if that's huh. possible, but we'll so see. I have one final question. I don't want to hog the podium too long. Could you go back to your South China Sea yeah. slide? Um, my, my basic question here is who was right? Um, and a, a couple of points about this. The only thing issue on which I can think of that Taiwan and China agree. Yeah, I was about to say that. This. Yeah, it's really interesting because they're always against each other, but Taiwan and China dissented against this together. Taiwan so. has been, you know, <laughs> yeah. Beijing is absolutely right. <laughs> yeah. They just love the Chinese position on this. Yeah. Um, and I just wonder whether there's some, some point to, to the uh, Chinese claims. Like, who has, China's claim is the sort of rightmost the nine dash line, right? Yeah, it's the, big, sort of the big red one that kind of comes down and hits everyone's sovereignty, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is but, it based just historically, or are, don't they don't they have some claim to sovereignty over some of these they islands? They do. The so it. It's very historical based. I mean, a, a lot of this is historically based. Even the Falklands, too, with, with Britain is very historically based. Um, but this especially after, you know, after World War II and, and Japan, you know, and kind of their campaign of, of establishing dominance in this area had a lot of sovereignty on these, these islands, but they kind of wrote it away. And, and China later picked it up and then um, kind of established their, you know, some sovereignty on these islands. Um, but it really wasn't, that big, I mean, fishing was a big deal, but now with hydrocarbons and, and, and the, you know, understanding that I think it's one eighth of the world's oil is, is in this area. It's, it's the second largest passage of trade in the world. I mean, there's just so much going on in this area, and it's so valuable for a country like China to have exerted its dominance over. At that point, they started, you know, doing island building. They started, you know, putting runway strips in these, in these islands where they could later say that this is an island, this ha should have exclusive economic zones because it's habitable. Um, but, you know, is it, you know, can you do that? Can you, you know, just dump a bunch of sand on an island and put like a, a runway strip and say it's habitable? That's the kind of the dispute that's going on. And that's why I think it's really important to go into like what, you know, what can sustain life and then what we should define as, as uh, something that is granted a maritime to tor territorial sea and then also an exclusive economic zone. Um, so yeah, I think China, a lot of it was just, you know, historically based. It, they went down through the South China Sea, they're shipping, and also they were fishing in this area, so they said, you know, there are Chinese nationals on these islands, they should be ours, but at the same time, you know, Japan, you know, could have made that claim, but they released a lot of it after World, World War II, I think, signed some treaty, sending you know, it over to The Japanese too. are still making these mattress-sized islands out yeah. in Japan, too, same thing, yeah. they want a donut of 200 miles around these little rocks. Yeah, so it, it's definitely interesting and there's a lot of shipping going on there and th you know in the future there might be you know a lot of drilling too and that's one of the big things that sparked this is, is China put a one of those semi-submersible rigs off the coast of Vietnam where you could just see it in the, in the, in the distance and the Vietnamese are very mad about that. China later moved it out of their yeah. area but it's just kind of a, a show of force that they can do that you know this is our area we can we're allowed to uh, to have this this uh, exclusive economic zone for ourselves and, and it's really kind of brought the whole like those ACN conferences that we've had and, and Obama was a big um, ACN, ACN I think the ACN, yeah. Yeah, ACN, yeah. Association yeah. Association Asso yeah. yeah. I mean we were a big proponent of those because we want to stand up to what the exerting force in, in the area was is China so I think um, you know it's Trump has kind of done away with that but that was a, a big um, kind of I, um, cheat. I have one little more yeah. question. Do you know if the Trump administration has continued the, the Bush and Clinton, uh, Obama policy sort of buzzing through the South China Sea to say, oh, these are international waters? Yeah, is, is uh, we, we have. And we've also done it in the Northwest Passage, too. And, and Stephen Harper and, and uh, Rush Justin Trudeau aren't that happy about it either. But that's kind of been our policy, is saying these are territorial waters. And I think it's, it's better for the international community, too, because there's a lot of shipping that goes on in this area. And it's better to have a 
you know, it's like the Bosphorus Sea. Like a lot of shipping goes on throughout that water. We should have, this should be territorial water. It's my personal opinion, so. You mean high seas? Is that what you mean? Yeah, high seas, yeah. Yeah, yeah international water, sorry, not territorial water. Yeah. International water. Yeah. So it's, you know, you don't get taxed. There's a certainty going about this other, you know, we can just, I think more certainty is the better than, than having these close calls with ships buzzing by each other. Fishermen have died. I think you know, there have been some real altercations in the area that have sparked close to war, so. Hopefully we can calm that down with adopting noon close. But yeah, so you want to? Yeah, Peter. I have a quick question. So I know the United States did not ratify it, but they still go to the arbitration as any other nation would against a different nation? Because you mentioned the US versus Nicaragua. Oh, that's a, that was a different issue. US versus Nicaragua was just. We went over then. That, that was in the world court. Um, yeah, that was. And we backed idea. out of the world court then. And it, and we've, we've still not accepted the world court's jurisdiction since. Um, and so that's actually one, one protection we have. If we wanted to rejoin the UN Convention on the Law of Sea, its dispute resolution mechanism wouldn't drag us into the world court, presumably. We could take a reservation if we're worried about yeah. it. Um, so um, there's really no downside to uh, ratifying it. That's what I think. But you know, there are people that. I agree. And the sort of socialist concern has been mitigated. We negotiated yeah. this agreement saying, well, basically, we're exempt from the, we can go ahead and develop. Yeah, we that, don't have to get permits to mine manganese nodules from the seabed floor. We're yeah. We're the United States. Contracts, we I mean. We get a special rule. Yeah, there, we have our own international law, basically. But, and, but we do take, and we're already being hit by it, because we do take most of it for customary international law, which is customary international law is practice plus in, in pinion juris, right? So we basically say it, it is the law, even though it's, it's not in a treaty, so we are, bound by the exclusive economic zones. And we can't just go start drilling in, in the Philippines exclusive economic zone because we kind of uh, say, you know, that that's their sovereignty. So we already kind of adopted it, you know, customarily, but uh, it, it'd be nice to, to have it so we can argue, you know, when big issues like the Arctic come up. But yeah, good question, Peter. Yeah. So very interesting hearing about the different definitions of, you know, one country says it's an island, the other says it's a rock. I was just curious what the status is for aircraft carriers. And, you know, you, because they could clearly classify as, you know, uh, sustaining life and they're pretty significant yeah. rocks <laughs> in the ocean. So, and how would you compare those uh, two? Yeah, you, yeah, they don't. Yeah. They, they are floating bits of territory yeah. in the state. That's it. But they don't have a 200-mile economy. <laughs> That'd be nice. <laughs> you, can, yeah. you can't drag fishermen around with your aircraft. <laughs> but on the aircraft carrier, if it's a U.S. carrier, our law applies. So if one service person murders another, it's U.S. It's as if it happened in U.S. soil. Um, and uh, if a foreign national commits a crime there. Um, but beyond that, it's just a little tiny floating bit of territory. Yeah, and rigs will have the same thing for semi submersible rigs too. They'll have a flag of convenience and they'll have like a country that they go for. So like the Deepwater Horizon was under Panama. I didn't know flag. that. Yeah. Rigs fly a flag? Mm -hmm. They fly a flag. So the, you know, under these rigs, they'll have really loose uh, you know, labor laws from Panama and they'll have the taxing will be from Panama too. So I think almost, you know, 75% of the flags being flown are from Panama because they're just really it's a small country, but they all use them because they're just great for, for labor law. And, and whose civil rights law and whose employment law also applies is also relevant. Those shippers would rather yeah. be cheap. They don't want U.S. Yeah. Uh, they don't want all those expensive American regulations applying. Yeah, citizen law is also really interesting. If you have like a baby that's born, maybe going into territorial water, like with a lot of caveats because there's a lot of treaty on citizenship, it could be an American baby because it's born in our territory waters, but if it's on the high seas, it could be the baby of the flagship. So. That's a really different, that would be really cool to be a lawyer for, for the international <laughs> <laughs> babies. But, yeah. But yeah, basically, it's, it's all fun. Anyone? Frank? Um, I have maybe two specific questions. I was just wondering about Gibraltar, which places in the world as well, the coast of Spain, and Russia's claims it feels like that 200 mile barrier right now, so it has a lot to do with each other, which I know the disputes are constant there um, with the Spanish Navy and the British Navy. I'm just interested if this has played a role in that. No, that's, that's, a no, that's a good one. I mean, there are like little things like that everywhere. Even Canada and Alaska have, the way Canada and Alaska come at a point, 
we say our exclusive economic zone goes like this, they say it goes like that. So, I mean, there's a lot of issues going on, stuff like Canada that. Maine but too. Canada, yeah. Canada and Maine. Uh, yeah. Just the only, um, there is a similar issue of maritime boundaries with respect to Barrett, with um, uh, Spain and Gibraltar, but beyond that, I don't know. I don't know how it's been resolved. Yeah, it's it's, it's like always that. one of the one, one, you know, yeah. they point in different directions because how you yeah. calculate it, even though the young class has these detailed sort of trig rules, it's like trigonometry, there's still, yeah, not, you know, geometry. the world is complicated. Yeah, I mean, no country is perfect right. boundaries, but I'd love to be on that panel that just draws it right down the middle, I think. That's, <laughs> but unfortunately, you know, the stakes are too high for issues like that, and with these subsoil rights that you give to these countries, um, you know, even oil fields aren't perfect squares, too, because some countries want it like that, and a lot of Caribbean countries have had have gone to the International um, Arbitration Court over issues like this because, you know, They'll say, "Yo, this guy's drilling into my oil fields," but then you know that's in their exclusive economic zone, and it's just um, a big mess. And, and that's why you need a kind of arbitration court to have countries come together and figure it out, kind of bilaterally. And it's important that I think we're a part of that. But yeah, anyone else? Billy. This is my only come to play when we're talking about climate change. But is there any guidance on, for example, when a country puts a rig in a territory that is clearly in their zone, however, climate change, the shoreline changes, thereby yeah. taking the rig out of their zone. How does that kind of have any guidance? That's, a, that's an amazing question, because I know you have the baseline rule, so it's at your lowest baseline, um, and uh, you have the 200 nautical miles off your lowest baseline, but with climate change, our baselines are changing, and it's a sad fact that even some countries, some island countries are going you know, underwater and all of a sudden they not have the exclusive economic zones because they're not habitable. So there's a lot of issues um, and there are some, um, there are tribunals in, from UNCLOS that will decide those issues, um, but you have to look more into that on how they'll decide, but I know that's gonna be one of the, the main issues going forward with climate change. Um, and you know, in the Arctic too is, is is, is going to melt too, and then all of a sudden that opens up a, a lot of, of issues up there. So I, I think, like I said, UNCLOS is very flexible, and they made some, some laws are very detailed, others are, are very um, broad just to is deal with issues like this, and even though it was adopted in the 80s, um, or it was finalized in the 80s, they were really thinking about issues into the future, and um, this is one of those unfortunate issues that I think is, is really going to go forward and affect you know, every country. So not only island countries especially, but, but even America, because our exclusive economic zones will change with that. Um, so yeah, I'll have to look into that, but that's a really good question. You mentioned a couple countries that aren't party. Why do states that are landlocked, I've never thought about this, why do they care about the UN Conventional Law? Why oh, does, so why does Austria, Austria doesn't have a navy. Yeah, this is a, it's actually really beneficial, probably the most beneficial for countries that are landlocked. So they thought about this, um, UNCLOS is very inclusive to countries that are landlocked, even though you think, like, what are their stakes in this? Um, so they actually get free, or they get, like, territorial, like, uh, rights of passage, and, and also a lot of uh, international waters that will lead to um, the ocean. So, like, like I said, Bosphorus Sea and other, other rivers that will lead from landlocked countries. So they have rights to, to use those waters, you know, um, na navigational rights, too, in, 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 um, in exclusive economic zones and other other rights that you know would just be for countries that are coastal countries. So they probably have the most to gain from this, even though they wouldn't have anything to gain from it in the beginning. Um, but yeah, and then, then there's also the, the subsea, um, uh, or the international, or the ISA, which would give some revenue, some financial revenue to all countries. Uh, but I think the most they have to gain is, is their international, um, you know, a lot of countries that are on rivers can have those rights to, to go into or f go through territorial waters that they wouldn't have before. Um, like her, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just because we explained with regard to China and Philippines, and where China claimed that the court didn't have jurisdiction, most yeah. of the disputes seem to be around jurisdictional issues and not on substantive law. And especially because we haven't ratified, and I personally think it's good not to ratify under the current political because we've taken ourselves out of SEON and national government, mm -hmm. so we should wait perhaps for the next administration to do that. But as someone who is interested in practicing in international and corporate law, I would like to know, based on your experience, what would you recommend for me to take uh, 
focus more in terms of uh, developing the basis for substantive law under which these international disputes could be resolved mm -hmm. without too much uh, bargaining power given to countries like China. Because although we don't have a bad one, we follow almost all the laws. But there are special nations like China that don't follow it, unfortunately. So how would you then advise, as a senior student, uh, one now like me, to uh, take classes in you know, Where should I focus in terms of developing my own expertise for substantive law and knowing that political climate will change and based on administration, but there's going to be a continuous stream of these dispute resolution that are going to occur. And if I work for a corporation, how am I going to advise them for you as well? Um, yeah, I, I think, so there are certain classes I think that will go over issues like this. Um, international public law, um, you know, goes over a, a lot of um, different treaties that, that have to do with, with similar issues to this, um, but also maybe conflicts of law is more on, on the private international law side too. Um, but you, you're right, I think it's, it's very tough to plan for the future when it comes to disputes like this because, you know, each administration has a kind of a wavering um, effect on this and then also it's, it's a very political issue sometimes too with our sovereignty and in, 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 in the Senate. Um, but it's just, you know, I, I think international public law is probably our best bet here um, for that. I don't think we offer a class on international maritime law, but, um, but. We used to, yeah. Stuart, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we, I mean, it's just a matter of, of interest if we had enough students who were yeah. But it just got to the point where we're, we only have one or two students. In our but we did have it for we did it every other year for a little bit of time. I spent like a whole, maybe a day on the law of the sea in my uh -huh. public international law class. Maybe a day and a half. I mean, I love it. It's fascinating. Yeah. It's a different yeah. universe. Um, um, but yeah, just take every international class you can get your hands on. Um, it's not going to completely prepare you for practice. Um, nothing will. But to start, because <laughs> I, I took every class I could, and I got to practice and said, whoa, I didn't learn any of this. Well, um, thank you all for coming. In the interest of time, we'll stop here and other, other questions, but don't you move, because we have no money for you. We do have a simulated wood plaque with your name on it, uh, as for, for Raymond for presenting, uh, I think, a, a really detailed and amazing um, PowerPoint and supported presentation today. So thank you all for coming. We'll be back next week. Appreciate it. Get a sandwich while you're leaving. Yeah. Thank you.